Good morning. Good morning. We're trying to clear up over here. Y'all hang with me. We will. So how are you? They got y'all. Y'all sleeping. Oh, they just started first. They no, no. Y- y'all, they, they got y'all. Y'all sleeping. Y'all sleeping. Y'all sleeping. Y- y'all were sleeping. Y'all were sleeping, you know. But uh, <clears throat> just once again, it <laughs> it is a blessing to be here in your presence, to be before you once again, to be useful to God in service one more time. Come on now. Come on now. There's a guy named Chris Fairless that's in our Tuesday night uh, Bible study, men's Bible study. And I said that to him in in, probably the first or second time we were in meeting. And I I said something, and then he went, and he would raise his hand. And I'm like, "Uh, you got a question? He goes, no, it was just good. (laughs) And... uh, and I went on and I said something else and then, and then, I, and then I, I, without thinking, I get excited. We're in a restaurant and I get excited and I'll say something and I'll say, come on now, somebody should say something, right? And then all of a sudden, okay, right, now every time he writes to us in his bill, you'll say, he'll, he'll make his statement and then he'll say, come on now, say something. <laughs> say something. <laughs> so when you know God is good, right? Yes, he is. You know, in, in, uh, I just want to ask your prayers this morning. Our sister Sherry, her sister went on to be with the Lord on yesterday. So keep her in prayer, her family, um, her sister Diane, her son and her husband and everybody else. Just keep them lifted up in this time. Um, and, 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 and this is the thing. I was so glad when I saw my sister Sherry this morning when I hugged her and I said, I'm sorry for your loss. She said, I ain't. She's not suffering. That blessed me. That blessed me. See, because see, only those who believe and know that their loved one went on, come on now, Amen. went to someplace better. Amen. Right? Amen. See, the world don't know that kind of love right now. Come on. Oh, my Lord. And she's sitting there, got a beautiful smile on her face, looking all gussied up and everything. <laughs> You know, um, I got to tell you something. When I'm standing there and we're singing and so forth, I'm praying in my head. There is nothing more beautiful to me in my heart and my soul to have my eyes closed with my heart lifted up to the Lord, but my ears hearing you sing praises unto our Heavenly Father. That blesses me tremendously. And the reason why I say that because please don't stop. Keep singing. Amen. Give Him your best. Amen. At all times. Amen. With whatever health you have in your body or don't have. Amen. You give it. Come on. You know, um, we just got through celebrating Thanksgiving. I pray that all y'all had a good turkey day. Yes. You know, we had a Cornish hen day at our house. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> Gumbo. See, yeah, gumbo, okay. But, you know, but it was good. My, my children were around me. It was blessed time, breaking of the bread. It, it was just family and just wonderful. It was wonderful opening your home and just, and, um, and once again this year we went around the table and we asked and shared with God what we were thankful for, you know. And, um, wow. I would still be sitting there right now if I tried to tell him every single thing. I was thankful for the meal would be gone and died off on the table by itself. Well, I'm just me, just sitting there telling him, right? Come on. God is good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Just real quick before I jump into the the word, let me check on a couple of announcements. One, I want to thank everyone who helped us feed the hungry on last Wednesday. Amen. Who came out to be a part of that experience. And I also want to thank you for those who supported the NF service day at Tracy Interfaith. And then also we have the Women's Ministry Christmas celebration on December 2nd coming up at the Lockwoods from 6 to 9 p.m. It says see the bulletin insert for that. And there is a card on the back table uh, um, for Raymond Jr. Look, baby Ray. He had, I think, his tonsils out this week. So please sign it, and we want to send it to him, let him know we're praying for him, we're thinking about him, and all that good stuff. And I will also share this. Um, 
thanking God first and foremost for it, we had been talking about going out and getting our nine second license in Little Red. And so with the upcoming surgery, we were like, mm, we don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So God worked it out. My health came back enough that we prepped the truck, took the truck out yesterday. And uh, I have to make six passes. They give you this, these, these rules that you have to meet. You just can't go out there and go nine seconds and go, get my license. They want you to go step by step. They want you to make a half pass and then two moderate passes. And then after that, they want to make one more pass. And then they want you to make two full passes at nine seconds or greater, you know, or greater than 135 miles an hour, you know, before. Cause, and then after you do all those things, you've got to find two race car drivers with license and good standing who's willing to sign off and say they're willing to sit in the car opposite you in the lane going that fast yeah and uh, but we were making our passes little red was hot laughing and I'm, my mind see I want to go fast and I got to go slow in these moderate things you know right so I'm launching hard and then I got oh you got you can't go fast and so I'm to hit those little numbers so we got that part down it came down to the place where we were supposed to hit our start running our nine numbers right and uh, first pass. Now, here's the thing: the the normally most folks can't get all these passes in on a single day, but. We were hot lapping. We'd make a pass. The truck still looked good on the day gauge and so forth. We went around to the next one and ran the next to get back up there so we can get in there. So the guy, the starting line guy, told us, he says, well, if you want to get them all in, he says, instead of waiting down here at the starting line for your team, tell your team to go down at the end down there and pick you, be waiting for you down there by the sign, and they can pick you up and just bring you right back around. That way you cut out all that extra, okay? Now, my very first pass at nine seconds to run nine seconds wide open. I'm sitting there. We get up in there. We do the burnout. Oh, it's beautiful, man. Smoke coming everywhere. It's in the truck. I'm smelling it in. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good, right? And I pull up there, and now this is like it. This is the moment of just everything, you know, the carburetor all open, no blockage from throttle stop. I'm on the trans brake button. I come off that button, and wham, and it's gone. And I said, the shift light comes on, boom, bump it in the second gear, and all of a sudden it goes, just by the time I get to the eighth mile, the hood goes, <laughs> it was a brown pants moment. Yes, it was. It was a brown pants moment. <laughs> and what's funny is when I get back to the pit, uh, basically when the hood comes up, I can't see. I'm looking at the motor, not the road. The hood pin, the boat on the bottom, the nut on the bottom of the hood pin came out because the hood pins were clipped in, but the hood came up. I'm looking at the motor, and as I, I just locked, I knew the truck was going straight, so I just locked it straight and started slowing it down. And as I slowed down, the hood goes, Right back into place. So I pull up in the pit. Pete and him hook me up and they pull me to the pit. And, and Sean is going, he goes, I, 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 well, you okay? I'm like, I'm good. He goes, it just came up. I go, I know it just came up. Now, Sean and Pete saw what happened to me. I get back to the pit where the missus is standing there. And she goes, why are you so down? <laughs> Why are you slow down? I go, huh? She goes, you was going, and then you slow down. Why? <laughs> well, baby, I wanted to live. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I got no other explanation. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, the hood came up. She goes, I didn't see the hood come up. <laughs> okay. Why did you slow down? You know, I'm like, <laughs> okay. But praise God, you know, he, he watched over us while we did that, but we are now officially nine second license certified, so. Yay. And, uh, that tells you how good the God will serve, you know. Now, <clears throat> I gotta share with you, we're, I was in the garage on Saturday listening to to God minister to me through music and uh, I wanted to go back 
I wanted to do just pick up and do a couple of real quick Christmas introduction kind of things going into this deal, and but I hadn't finished the um, reaching the harvest pieces. And so I'm listening to these wonderful songs and it's ministering to my heart, talking about how much, how God loves us and how he sees us and how he desires us to come to him and, and that we just should have joy and, you know, all these wonderful things. And it was beautiful, right? And then while I'm listening to it, I go into the house and I open the word and I'm in my office and I'm reading through it. And next thing you know, I found myself writing a new message. And so the message that sits before you today that you will hear is now back on the path of the harvest because I already harvest messages was written, but I rewrote it for whatever reason because that's what he led me to do. So that's what you will hear this morning. Um, but here's what I want you to understand. When you hear the songs, the Christmas songs and so forth singing, there's one that talks about, and it, it, I think they took the, 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 the inspiration from, it, from Luke chapter 2, verse 10 to 14, where it says this. Then the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid, but for behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so that's what I was hearing. It was in my heart and my soul, but right, but I want you, there's a couple words I want you to realize that stood out as I'm reading and as I'm ministering, as I'm listening to it and I'm loving it and I go back into his word, he says this, that it will be to all people. And then he says this, in, on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. You see, oftentimes I find out that we say to ourselves that uh, the world doesn't know what we know about Christ. Right? And so, if the world does not know what we know about Christ, then they don't know that he's an advocate. They don't know that he loves them just the way they are. That you ain't got to clean up yourself first before you can come to him. They don't know those things. See, all these things is going to be in the manger, by the way. Do you get it? All of this is in the manger as the baby, as, as Mary is carrying him around. That's in the womb. So, Pete, can you, can y'all bear with me and listen to this? scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. When they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear him. So he's officially ignoring them. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Jesus has raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She says, No one Lord, Jesus said to her, no doubt with a smile, neither do I charge you with an offense. Go and sin no more. But I think Jesus, for us, exemplifies the attitude, the heart, and the spirit of an advocate. Notice, they said, Jesus, she's caught in adultery. And they, they, they proudly declare, we caught her in the very act. And they said, so what do you say, Jesus? And they quote the law accurately. What do you say, Jesus? And notice he, uh, he says nothing. Which tells me that the spirit of an advocate is slow to speak. If we're all honest, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to 
Let the attitude of an accuser wiggle its way into your life. I think if we're all honest, we've had a, a rock or two in our hands. It's easy for us to go, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an accuser. But, but, but it's in our attitude, it's in our spirit. Accusers have levels of lostness. Have you noticed this? I've noticed it in my own life. I, I, have, I define levels, particularly in, in, in industries that are on the forefront of our entertainment and music. And we, we, we easily throw rocks at actors and actresses and artists. And I can't believe their lyrics. I can't believe their music. I can't believe the movie they did. Oh my God, so bad. I hear Christians making fun of prominent figures in entertainment and on television because we can take cheap shots at them because we think we'll never know them. But some of them are my friends and I'm trying to pastor them and love them. And yet I hear Christians making fun of them. They need a church too. They need a pastor too. They need someone who will show them the love of Jesus too. Is our gospel big enough to welcome everybody in our church? Are we big enough for actors and actresses and artists? Are we big enough to say, come on, you're welcome here. This is your family. This is your home. We'll love you. Jesus is the great leveler. Even the, the physical posture of Jesus preaches the message of grace to us. For Jesus' posture is down in the dirt. While the religious, pompous, arrogant leaders of the day, they stand in their arrogance with rocks in their hands. These postures even demonstrate the attitude of an accuser and the attitude of an advocate. Oh, they stand so tall and so proud, but with the words of Jesus, he levels the playing field and he says, Oh, oh, pastor, reverend, bishop, you're the same as this woman. You're no different. We don't need any more churches that are standing in their arrogance with rocks in their hands and their pockets. We need churches who are in the dirt with people that are broken and hurting and need the love of God. That's got to be the church. We run towards the messes. We run towards the broken. We run towards the hurting. We don't turn away. We run towards them. We're there to hold them and to love them and defend them and think well of them and speak well of them and believe the best. That's the spirit of our Savior. What if we had a whole church that was thousands, then became tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands in the same region, and all of us carry with us the attitude of an advocate, the attitude of compassion and mercy and grace and love towards hurting, broken, lost people. And at the end of this story, Jesus tells this sinful woman, he says, I don't come to bring you accusation. He says, now go and sin no more. Do you know why? Because she had just encountered grace and faith had erupted in her heart. And now she could finally live the life she only dreamed of. Because it's grace that sets people free from sin. Not law, not legalism, not customs, not traditions, not do's and don'ts, but the grace of God. where God has had me. He run toward it. You see, this is the message that's in the manger. We like the idea of the baby Jesus. We like the idea of him coming and being the great peacemaker and the wonderful counselor and all in the mighty God. We like that. And there's nothing wrong with liking that. But when we realize that the world in which he saved us for doesn't know that. That's the Christmas message that we need to be getting out there. 
that he is an advocate. He is a savior. He is, he has love for them. And so if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, starting at the 35th verse, say amen when you have it. If not, say wait on me. Amen. See, this, this summed up to the best of my ability where God has me. That when I'm looking at those who would does not exemplify Christianity or any of those things. I can have my rock in my hand and do my best to stone them, but I do nothing to draw them to God. Come on, Come on. Nothing. And it doesn't change the situation. The scripture simply tells us that when a, a believer picks up a carnal weapon, we look so horrible when we use it because it's not the weapon in which he called us to use and so as I think about it as you look at the things that people of faith might throw out there in their social media world even in their conversations with people around them that's a rock that's a stone You've forgotten what you've been called and saved for. We have it, Matthew 9, starting the 35th verse. It reads this way. Then Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply to say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be used in service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come where your people have gathered themselves together once again to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power. That you would fill me afresh and new with your Holy Spirit. And that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. This morning's sermon title is called Reaching the Harvest Includes Being in Their Pathway. And at the top of your outline, you will find the words, being in their pathway is, being in their pathway is to intentionally walk into the harvest field and earn the right to share the good news of the gospel. Sharing that Jesus wants them to know how much he truly loves them. And so I start by just wanting to say to you again this morning, welcome. But before we transition into our Christmas messages, I would like to complete the mini-series started uh, several weeks ago on Reaching the Harvest. Some of you may have seen the movie Schindler's List. In the movie Schindler's List, one of the most moving scenes is near the end of the three-hour drama. Oscar Schindler had invested his energy and his fortune in saving the lives of hundreds of Jews who would have otherwise been killed in Hitler's Holocaust. Because the war was at its end, the Jews he saved will become free men and women, while Schindler himself will become a fugitive. He walks, this is the picture, he walks to his car with his Jewish friend, and the others are around him, and Schindler begins to cry. He looks at his watch, and he knows if he had sold it, he could have saved one more life. And then he looks at his car, and he knows that he could have exchanged it for some additional lives. And he says to his friends, he says, I could have done more. I could have done more. Oscar Schindler knew he could have done more to save Jews from perishing in death camps. You see, this morning, you and I could do more to save people from perishing in hell's fire. 
Jesus did all he could. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Now, if you look up above that, you find that Jesus was going all over the place, healing and touching and preaching all the way through. Look at the verse in Matthew chapter 9. If you read the whole thing, you find that this is what he was doing. This was a reoccurring theme. He was going out. He was in the community. He was in the harvest with the people, touching, preaching, teaching, healing, doing everything that he could. And you come to this verse here. But you see, it was when Jesus saw the crowds, the multitude of people who needed to be saved from eternal death, he was moved. You see, when you and I see the people as Jesus saw the crowds and as Oscar Schindler saw the Jews in Nazi Germany, it will move us. If we are to see lives saved and won to Christ, we need to see the harvest as Jesus saw the harvest of spiritually lost people dying and facing a Christless eternity. You see, it's in verse 37a. We see how Jesus saw the harvest. It says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. You see, here's the thing. The world is big. The crowds are huge. The number of spiritually lost and dying people is overwhelming. And in Jesus' day, the population of the world was approximately 150 million people. Today's world population grows by 150 million people every two years. The world's population right now exceeds 6 billion people with the population of the United States over 300 million. Not only was the harvest of people vast as Jesus looked upon it, but it's in verse 36a we see those people brought tears to his eyes. It says this, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. You see, all those people then and now matter to Jesus. I'm going to say it again. All those people then and now matters to Jesus. All. You see, the word used for compassion is the strongest word for pity in the Greek language. It describes the love that moves a person to the depths of their being. It is the type of love that moves people to cry for others as Oscar Schindler cried for the Jews. It is the love that moves people beyond sentimental feelings to heartfelt action. When he saw them... He had compassion. When have you looked out upon a crowd of people who was just doing whatever that did not please you and you find compassion in your heart? If anything, you found your stones. Some of you may know who Roy Fish is. Roy Fish served as a professor of evangelism at South Southwestern Baptist Seminary. Years ago, I'm going to share this little story I read about him. It's about his son. Years ago, his infant son had an illness that almost killed him. Fish's heart broke at the thought of his son dying. As his son's fragile body laid in a hospital bed, Fish asked in his heart this question. What would I regret most if my son died? And he pondered that question. The answer came clear. He says, I would regret that he died never knowing how much I loved him. You see, Jesus' heart grieves over every soul. God grieves because those who die without Christ will never know how much he loves them. You see, it's in verse 36b. We see how Jesus described the challenge that he saw in the crowd. He says this, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So listen to how Jesus says it. Jesus described the crowd as being harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed means that they were defeated by life. They were defeated. The toils and struggles had punched them in the gut one too many times, and they are down for the final count and ready to quit. Helpless means that they were broken without a purpose. They were wandering aimlessly, people without hope, without meaning, without a reason for living. And then he says this, like sheep without a shepherd, means that they were they would follow any fad or guru, a new idea or way, even to their destruction. You see, sheep are dumb animals. 
They simply put their heads down and follow the sheep in front of them. If a guide or leader doesn't exist, they will simply wander and wander and wander until they destroy themselves. Those three thoughts. Harassed. Helpless. Sheep without a shepherd are a fitting description of our society today. Ralph Waldo Emerson was right when he said people are living lives of quiet desperation. They are desperate for a meaning and a purpose, distraught by the world's lies and, and, and heading for destruction. You see, they are walking down the path that Jesus referred to in Scripture as the broad road that leads to death. You see, I'm talking about working in the and reaching the harvest this morning. You see, it's in John chapter 4 verse 35b. Jesus shares another enlightening perspective about the harvest. He says this, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that are white for harvest. It says white, W-H-I-T-E. This is the New King James and your New American Standard both says it that way. And so I understand that ripened wheat takes on a golden hue when ready to be harvested. However, if reaping is delayed, the grain begins to turn a pale white and will soon fall over to the ground. So this too speaks of the fields of, of, of white for harvest is to stress the critical need of getting into the fields before it's too late. You see, there is always a sense of urgency in bringing in the harvest. So, and of the 6 million billion people in the world today, it is estimated that over 31 million people will die without Christ this year. They will die not knowing how much He loves them. Why? When He told them. We are ambassadors. We love all the accolades that God lavishes on us as Christians. We love it when we know that we're his ambassador. We know that we're his children. We love those things. But here's the thing. An ambassador carries the message of the one who sent him. And if, he, if we are his ambassadors, then he sends us with the message to tell the world, first of all, that he loves them, and second of all, that he is their advocate. Amen. So you ask yourself, 31 million people will lose their life this year and not know that he loved them. And you see, the, and the greater than the 300 million people in this country, it is estimated that 41% of the people are radically unchurched. Do you know what that means to be radically unchurched? That means that they don't go to church at all. Not Easter, not Christmas, not to a wedding, nor to funerals. They do not darken the doors of a church at any time of the year. And, and if they were to die, they would go to eternal punishment without knowing the love of Christ. You see, there is always a sense of urgency to bringing in the harvest. You see, y'all know I'm a fan of old school preaching. There is a young man. Uh, well, he's gone now. Um, pastor, funny kind of a guy, he had a whimsical little sense of humor about him, but he was right on. His name was Vance Havner. Vance Havner, but that boy could whoop some words. He'd put that Bible on you too, but he could whoop some words, right? I've been listening to him, and he, he, he said this. He said, the tragedy of our time is that the situation is desperate, but the saints are not. He said, the travesty of our times is that the situation is desperate, but the saints are not. We're not desperate to get out into the field. We're not desperate to go out there and, and tell people how God loves them and to show them, not just throw some paperwork at them. See, I, we, you don't get preaching like that no more. We want you to feel good about yourself. I told my bride last night, when she, I was in the office, I read a portion of the message to her last night. I told her, I said, baby, I wish I got to preach a lot of feel-good messages. Yes, but here's the thing. I am called to equip you for the job that he saved you for. So that's why you don't wait. You don't all walk out here going, oops. But here's the thing. Maybe this is the reason why you never post up on your Facebook page. Man, service show was good today. 
Because it never happens. Because, see, here's the thing. Maybe the word hurts you. I don't know. But you see, if I had something good like this coming to me that gave me stuff that built me and made me better, I couldn't wait to tell somebody about what God had just revealed to me that I've now put into life, into the practice into my life, and I'm going to live it out now. I couldn't wait. If you're going to fill your stream and your Facebook page or your Snapchat or whatever, fill it with something like this that brings life and not death. Come on. Say it. You see, we live in desperate times, and desperate times demand actions. You see, we're living in a time when little boys kill little girls. We're living in a time where teenagers take out their revenge on other teenagers, and people steal and cheat and kill because they simply demand their own way. Come on. You see, we live in a lost and broken world that is desperate for the good news of Jesus Christ. See, three weeks before President John Kennedy was assassinated, he said these words. Almost all presidents leave office feeling that their work is unfinished. He says, I have a lot to do and so little time to do it. That was his words three weeks before he died. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have so much work to do and so little time to do it in. We must give ourselves to it. The times demand urgent action. Remember, the gospel is only good news if it arrives in time. The gospel is not good news when you're stretched out and there's six people carrying you around your coffin to your gravesite. It's not good news then. The good news is only good news if it arrives in time that you can do something with it. Come on now. Man, I know everybody's busy. I know we got more on our plate than we can say grace over. And so hearing somebody else coming along with a problem, I ain't got time for it. I'm doing me and mine right now. And that's the problem. All we're doing is me and mine. And the world's going to hell in the handbasket. And you're looking up at God going, Whoa, Lord, why? And he's looking at you going, Because you ain't doing. <laughs> we take care of those that we care about. We're good at that. But there's no... We can't carve out a piece of the pie that our life actually interacts and touches someone that we do not have an interest in, really, because they may have said something we don't like or, or they think a different way or their worldview is different from my worldview. See, I was never called to say, based on whether I bring the message to you, whether your worldview matches mine or not. See, that's the issue with the world. It will never match my view because they don't know what I know. And I can't expect it to change until they have a chance to hear and know what I know. And if they never get that, then their worldview has no reason to change. See, they need to know that they have an advocate that's praying for them, that wants them to succeed on his side and not the world's side. But they don't know that. Because maybe the version of what they saw in Christ didn't look like Christ, but looked like the world. You see, it's in verses 37 to 38 that Jesus tells, tells us that the harvest is priority. Listen to what he says. You see, we need to feel what Jesus feels. He is overwhelmed by his love for the people as he sees the vastness of the crowds and the perplexity of their problems. The sense of urgency in reaching them. Listen to what he says in verses 37 to 38. And then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So here's the deal. He's looking at his disciples and he's telling them that the harvest is plentiful. These are the ones who would be working in the field. He's looking at him and telling him. And then he says these words here. Now ask the Lord of the harvest. And he's standing right there to send workers into his 
harvest field. So if someone asks you to go out there and meet and, and, and get outside of your comfort zone and touch a life and walk with somebody and invest in somebody and you might lose some money, you might lose some sweat, you might even lose a little bit of blood, you may even get taken once or twice of the experience, but you don't stop going to the harvest. Come on. Too often we can sit there and say someone has used me, they just used me, they did whatever. Okay, get over it, move forward. Get over it. Move forward. Because, see, the government can't change what's happening in this world. You can write all the laws that you want, but it never changes the sin nature of people. So you can sit there and petition your congressmen and your senators and everything else all you want. Keep writing and keep sitting on your backside. And you'll watch the hell go, watch the world go down the drain. Spinning faster. Every letter you write. See, I think this is the reason why I like old messages. Because I think when they shared the word back then, they shared it with the expectation that when it hit that heart that loves the Lord, It immediately went into practice in those lives and they went out. And they created awkward conversations by going, hey, how you doing? My name is Billy. Nice to see you. You live in the neighborhood? Great, great. Wife and kids? Oh, that's wonderful. So I got a church around here? Oh, you don't? Okay. Well, you know, since you're, would you like to come and have dinner with me in the my family on next Tuesday? You see, he didn't have a Bible in his hand. It's in his heart. Come on. He touched him, learned a little bit about him, and then he made himself vulnerable by opening up his home to him. That's almost unheard of today. Almost unheard of. But yet we'll go in our homes or on our cell phones and we will thumb it out, snap it out, chat it out, tweet it out. But you won't have this out. You won't have this. You see... I learned more about how to turn my enemy into my friend when I walked with my enemy. You see it? See, when someone's your enemy, you built, you got your rock because they're your enemy. But I'm called to win my enemy, not for me. But for the Lord. See, the harvest field is not uh, its not a playpen. It's not a jump house. Um, it's not filled with fun things all the time. There's real people struggling with real issues. Just like us. The only difference is we, we've got grace and mercy. And we know he loves us. And we know he's our advocate. And we know he cares. You know, if you're going to give a gift. See, I, I can't think of anything that I could give. That's going to last somebody eternal. If it's not God. You may, be, may have saved all year long. For your Christmas list of people that you're going to buy for. And whether it's clothing, jewelry, mechanics, electronics, whatever. Eventually all that's going to not function or not going to be able to fit it or it's going to break. And they move on from that. You know you read in scripture where it says only what you do for the Lord shall last. I 
Let's finish this. You see, you need to know that the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day saw the common people as chaff to be destroyed and burned up. Jesus saw them as a harvest to be reaped and to be saved. The Pharisees in their pride looked at the destruction of sinners and Jesus in love died for the salvation of sinners. And herein lies the greatest truth of the Christian faith. The harvest will never be reaped unless there are reapers in the field to reap it. Jesus Christ needs men and women to bring to bring in the harvest. Jesus' followers today, we need to see people as Jesus saw them, as plentiful, as precious, as perplexed and perishing. And so you might be asking yourself right now, well, what can we do? And maybe you're not asking that question because you know it comes with work. But look at this. We can take responsibility for our field. See, talking to a country boy now, right? I was driving down the road yesterday and we saw a hog running down the street. And first thing I thought of was ham and bacon. (laughs) But you see, when you understand that when something is in your field, you're responsible for what comes and grows up out of that field. And when you realize that, so you understand that wherever you are in life, you are responsible for a field that's in front of you. And you go, well, what's my field, Pastor? Well, here it is. Your field is your family, your friends, your neighbors, your work associates, the person at the cleaners, the guy at the car wash, the people at your sporting events, the people at your barbershops and salons, those you meet in your community, wherever you are, that is your field. We are responsible for them. See, we will never have a sense of urgency and priority until we realize that we are responsible for them. You walk past them as if they're nothing. Because you don't feel any sense of responsibility. Because all I care about is mine. You see... There's no reason to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, if you're not willing to tell anybody else. There's no reason to sing joy to the world, the king has come, if you're not willing to tell nobody else. There's no reason. So I know everybody's looking forward to singing the Christmas carols and getting on over to the feel-good side of the steel, right? But the message has not changed. What was in the manger still, what he's talking about right now, is getting out there and sharing the message that he came to bring. That's it. That's it. You see, it starts with prayer. When we begin to see the people as Jesus saw them, then we will pray for the harvest. We will pray for the salvation of the lost and for the church to be trainers of reapers. That's what I am. I'm a trainer of reapers that's it all day long 24 7 365 plus one in the leap year (laughs) i'm a trainer of reapers because if we can't get out there if we're not in the field if we're not impacting lives for the kingdom then what good are we i told my bride you know, all I want is him to give me enough health to preach. He can take away everything else, but give me enough health to preach. Because this is, if I'm going to go, I'd rather go doing this than anything else. Than anything else. This is why I step out in the, into the pathway of people. I get outside of my comfortable circle and I walk with those who don't know what I know and they don't know him like I know him. This is why. In the beginning, it's awkward and it's scary because it's new. But believe it or not, if you were at a sporting event 
and you weren't there to talk about Jesus or even to introduce him to him, you could find very easy to have a conversation with someone that you totally did not know. Y'all would find common ground. Is that your team? Man, that's my team too. Did you see the quarterback they had last year? Oh, we'd be all into it. But then how come we can't be that same way? When we're coming along to walk alongside of them and earn that right to run the heart, the truth of who Christ is. You see? We, we got selective when we want to do. Y'all heard me a few weeks ago when that guy, Wine, Harvey Weinstein or whatever, they brought him up and so forth. <gasps> I was so serious when I said I would love an opportunity to walk with him. I know he's got a major sin going on in his life. But you say, I don't want to stone him. I want to earn the right to write on his heart. You see, I'm, my perspective, my view, my heart is different about what I see. I know the world is broken. It's supposed to be. Because they don't know what I know. Now, if I go back, just think back a couple, two or three weeks, maybe a month or so ago. I told you that if you understand regardless of what evil that shows up in the world, we always understand what the root cause of it is. It's sin. And yet we know the cure to sin we carry. But yet, somehow, that cure is not getting out into the harvest. But yet we're crying out, God, please do something. Change. Lord, help us. Do something. And he's going, I am. I'm giving you life every single day. I'm giving you breath. Every single day I'm giving you strength. Every single day I'm giving you energy. Every single day I'm giving you another opportunity. Your car still starts. Your legs still work. Your heart's still beating. But yet you're saying, Lord, come on, do something, God. Come on, man. You see, here's the thing. We must do more than just pray as well. We must also go. When we see people as Jesus saw them, we will go into the harvest. We can't bring in the harvest without first going into the harvest ourselves. Our job is not to save the harvest. That's God's job. Our job is to tell people about the Lord of the harvest. The gospel begins with go. And without going, there is no knowing. See, if we don't go, then who will? See, we can share our story. And see, the great sin of the church is the sin of silence. People often say, well, I'm, I'll let my life be my witness. By the way, if you are saying that to yourself this morning, my question is, how is that working out for you? How many people have come to know Christ because they watched your life? You see, you, you, you should be living a good life because that adds back up to the words that you may share. You see, we've taken the great commission and made it the, into the great omission. A subtle false teaching that says that we can be evangelical without being evangelistic. It has us believing that we can go to, we, re, we can go rather to church than to go into the world. But you say, there are so many people, the harvest is so vast and the needs are so overwhelming. What can I do? Right? Because that's normally where we are. Let's just be real. And all I'm going to do, I'm going to close you and just share this simple story with you about a young man and an old man. says this I'm reminded of the old man walking the beach at dawn who noticed the young man ahead of him picking up starfish and flinging them into the sea catching up with the youth he asked what he was doing and the answer was that the stranded starfish would die if left in the morning sun but the beach goes on for miles and there are millions of starfish countered the old man. How can you, how can your effort make a difference? The young man looked at the starfish in his hands and then he threw it safely back into the waters. And then he says this, it makes a difference to this one. It makes 
a difference to this one. Everyone. You see, I hope your heart will be stirred to be a difference in the harvest. I've never led a mass group of people to Christ ever. Most of the time it's been one on one. Every now and then two on one. But it matters. You see, I'm okay with baby steps. Give me one. And let me grow to two. And maybe three. Because if I'm getting the heads of the family, I got a chance for God to get a whole family. See what I'm saying? You see, when when we see people as Jesus saw people, it will cause us to take responsibility to pray, to go, and to tell others about Jesus. Oscar Schindler said, I could have done more. I'm telling you this morning, we can do more when it comes to bringing in the harvest of souls. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you. God, I thank you for once again another opportunity to be used in your service. Master, I pray that all that was shared here this morning was acceptable in thy sight. God, I just got to say it. You know, this is the image that keeps replaying over and over and over in my mind as I've been the last at least three months, I can say. And you know this. That when Pontius Pilate stood up there and he had you and Barabbas standing before him. And he says to the people, which one shall I let go? And they yelled out, Barabbas. And they set Barabbas free. You didn't say a word. Because you came to die for Barabbas. You came to show him how much you loved him. And that blessed me. Because every time I think about it, instead of Barabbas standing there, there's Patrick. Guilty of everything that they said and also some things that they hadn't said. And yet, you had not done anything but love them. And you proved it. You just let him walk away. You didn't sit there and say about, call him out on all of his sins and all of his other. You gave him an opportunity to see your light. To see your love. To see your care. So even now, Master, I'm going to go back to the cross where you look out. They got you stretched wide and hung high. And even then, Father, you look out over the masses and you say to them, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's the love. There is the advocate. Because you could have said, you're killing me. But you pleaded on our behalf and even when you put your chin in the locks of your shoulder and you said father it's finished and they took you down off the cross and they put you in a borrowed tomb you see the story doesn't in there 
because the scriptures bear witness to. And not only that, my life bears witness to that you got up. Not with some power, but with all power. Heaven and earth in your hands. Power to save. Power to change lives. Power to let me live eternal with you. But you didn't do it just for me. You did it for whosoever would believe. So right now, God, as your reapers, Help us to see the people the way you see them. Help us to love and have compassion for them the way you have love and compassion for them. Help us to feel a burden, a responsibility that we would go out desperately to bring in the harvest before it's too late. And even now, Master, as we prepare our hearts and minds to share in our offering. Father God, bless the offering that we're about to receive. May be used for the uplifting and building of your kingdom. Bless those who have it to give and bless those who have it not. Then the next opportunity that they be to do so and do so cheerfully. And Father God, we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says, Amen and Amen.